Today, I'm honored to be with you guys again. I want to welcome everyone to Northwoods, wherever you're joining us from, whether online or here in person. We're in the second part of a series we started last Sunday with Brother Timothy, and we're calling it Seven, because we're looking at the seven redemptive names of God. And we call them redemptive names because each of them reveal what Jesus purchased for us through his redeeming work, through his death and resurrection. And before we dive into today's passage and the name we're gonna look at, I felt I needed to share with you what has been on my heart. As I was praying last Saturday before the start of this series, I was praying from Ephesians 1 that the Father would give to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know him better. And it was then, as I was praying that, that this idea of the knowledge of God began to grip me. And I suddenly, I, I remembered the words from the prophet Hosea when he said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And to my surprise, I, I came in that night not actually feeling very prayerful. And to my surprise, the tears started to flow and I got a sense of burden as I was praying and asking God that we would not be a church who's destroyed for lack of knowledge, that we would be a church who truly and intimately knows the Lord Jesus firsthand by experience that the Lord would release to us through this series an increase in the knowledge of God. And so I share that prayer with you for two reasons. First, because I truly believe that the Lord wants to use this series to grow us corporately and individually in the knowledge of God. Of course, according to the scriptures, that's always God's desire for us. But I believe that it's uniquely on God's heart for this summer as we move through this series. And secondly, I share that with you to invite you to make it your prayer, your prayer throughout this series that all of us would stay in a place of asking God to give to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know him better every Sunday as we gather. So Father, that's our prayer at the start of today. Lord, help us. Holy Spirit, come. We ask for the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you'd help our hearts and our minds to understand. Lord, that you would allow us not only to know you better here today, but Father, I pray that each one of us, our hearts would be stirred, that when we leave here today, our hearts would be stirred with a desire to say, I want to know God more. He's amazing. So Holy Spirit, come, open our hearts. We ask it in the name of Jesus, amen. All right, now last Sunday, Brother Timothy spent some time talking to us about Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. And today, we're gonna look at Jehovah Rapha, which is the Lord, our healer. And this name's revealed to the people of Israel immediately after their deliverance from the armies of Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea. So we're gonna pick up the story in Exodus chapter 15, verse 22. So if you got your Bibles, if you got a brick and mortar Bible, you got your phone, go ahead and get there to Exodus 15, verse 22. And we're gonna read just through to the end of that chapter. So Exodus 15, 22, it says, then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days, they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Merah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Merah. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? And then Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water and the water became fit to drink. There, the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, 
where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. Now, I'll be the first to admit, that sounds like a little bit of an odd passage when we just read it on the surface, and rightly so. But before we dive into more of that passage, because there are some great truths there, we need to look at the word Rapha there in verse 26. I've observed that when Christians use the name Jehovah Rapha in reference to the Lord, they often understand it solely in regards to God's ability and his desire to heal individual bodies from sickness. And that's not a wrong way to understand it or apply it. But there is way more wrapped up in that name, the Lord who heals us, Jehovah Rapha, way more than just healing us from individual illness. Dr. Michael Brown is one that I've esteemed for quite a while. He holds a PhD in Near Eastern languages and literatures. He's authored over 40 books and he is the host of a national Christian radio program. And he wrote his dissertation on the Hebrew word Rapha. And then he took his studies even further and he wrote his book called Israel's Divine Healer, which is over 400 pages long, and the end notes are actually more than the text itself. <laughs> it's a beast. <laughs> and because of this, he has unique insight to offer us when it comes to understanding God as Jehovah Rapha. So this is what he says. He says, in every instance, the root Rapha is used with reference to restoring a wrong, sick, broken, or deficient condition to its original and proper state. This recognition provides insight into Israel's understanding of the Lord as Rapha, since one and the same root word is used for the healing of body and spirit, land and water, city and nation. And then he says this, the Lord as Rapha could be asked to make infertile wombs fruitful, to mend earthquake-torn lands, to make poisonous waters wholesome, or restore an apostate people. Now, though it's true that any biblical word has one Meaning, in any given context, we cannot separate the Lord's name, Jehovah Rapha, from all that we then see him rapha <laughs> through the rest of Scripture. And yes, I made that word up. <laughs> we can't separate the two. So church, I would say to you today, based on the testimony and evidence of the word of God, that the Lord Jehovah Rapha is infinitely more than just a restorer of sick bodies. In this name, he is revealed to Israel and has revealed to us that wherever there is a sick, broken, diseased, or deficient condition, whether it's a relationship, a land, a nation, a government, a church, a family, a marriage, a heart, or a soul, the Lord, the God of Israel, is the great restorer. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is the one who makes whole. He is our healer. You remember that verse that we spent a whole series on from 2 Chronicles 7.14? I'll jog your memory. It says, the Lord is saying this to Solomon. It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will, heal, I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. That word for heal, it's the same Hebrew root. And it's the Lord saying that he's gonna heal the physical land and weather and he's gonna heal the spiritual condition of his people. We can also consider Psalm 147, verse three, where it says, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Again, same root in Hebrew, 
But this time it's applied to the Lord healing inner emotional wounds of the heart. And then again in Jeremiah 3.22, the Lord says to Israel, return, O faithless sons, and I will heal your faithlessness. And wouldn't you know it, again, the same root word in Hebrew. But this time the Lord is telling unfaithful Israel that he's gonna heal the spiritual compromise in the sin of their lives if they will return to him. So based on this evidence, we should all be clear today that God being Jehovah Rapha is far more than healing physical bodies, far more. As marvelous as that is on its own. No, he is the restorer, he is the healer of all things. So, now that we're a little more clear about what Jehovah Rapha means, we're gonna look back at our passage in Exodus and we're gonna answer the question, how do we experience Jehovah Rapha? In other words, since it's true that God is the healer and the restorer, how now do we experience that healing and that restoration for our lives? Many of you came in here today, and as I've been talking, you've been resonating with, you know that there are things in your life that need restored, that need healed. And so this is a question that all of us need the answer to. And in fact, as a quick sidebar, I wanna underline that every name of God we touch on in this series, it's an invitation to experience God. Every name of God, they're not just cute little phrases to put up on social media or to hang in your house, so there's nothing wrong with that. God has revealed himself in these ways because he actually wants to be that for you. And for me, he wants to be these things in the lives of his people. So his names are an invitation to us. Now that being the case, I believe there are important truths in this passage that will lead all of us into a deeper experience of the restoring and healing work of God. And again, keep in mind that these truths apply to all kinds of healing, be it physical, emotional, relational, national, etc. So again, how do we experience Jehovah Rapha? The first is embrace your crisis. Embrace your crisis. Brother Timothy actually touched on this shortly last Sunday, but we see it again here in our Exodus passage. And we see it all through scripture. So listen, listen very carefully. More often than not, God uses crisis. He uses trouble, difficulty, danger, and pain as an opportunity for his people to experience him. Think again about the context of our passage. It was through the crisis of slavery in Egypt that Israel experienced God as their savior and deliverer, right? They knew that, they, that he could save them, but it's way different when you see the sea part right before your eyes, a pillar of fire behind you. <laughs> they experienced it. And now, we get to Exodus 15, they face another crisis. They've gone without water for three days. I don't know about y'all, but I'm about ready to die from dehydration after three hours, let alone three days. They're actually close to death in the middle of a desert. They're in a crisis. But the crisis became the opportunity for them to experience God as Jehovah Rapha not only restoring what was undrinkable water, but ultimately restoring them. In fact, just because he's that extravagant and gracious, God doesn't only give them water at Merah, but that last verse that kind of seems odd to us when we read it, he takes them to Elim 
in verse 27, and he gives them 12 springs of water. And he gives them a practical forest of palm trees for shade. And it's God just saying, hello, if you just look to me, I'd help you out. (laughs) He outdoes himself to provide for them. But they experienced Jehovah Rapha through their crisis. So think about this. Isn't it kind of, it's kind of common sense, right? How do you experience God as your restorer unless there's something that needs restoring? How do you experience God as your healer unless there's someone or something that needs healed? The very thing that needs restored or healed is what provides the opportunity for God to come in and restore and heal. So let me ask you today, are you in a crisis right now? I know that might seem like an extreme word, so let's broaden it and just say, is there a trouble, is there a difficulty, is there a challenge you're up against right now in your life? Because there is a deeper experience of God hidden in your crisis. There's more of God to be had and encountered in the pain that you're going through. I like the way that one worship leader said it. He said, consider it a gift when God becomes your only option. Why? Because if you let it, your desperation will drive you to him. And when you get to him, you have all you need whether your crisis changes or not. So you must embrace your crisis, not because your crisis is in itself a good thing, but because God wants to meet you in the midst of it. I I went through a, a very difficult time now, almost two years ago. I faced a number of what was for me, they were shattering relational losses And it drove me into a grief and a darkness that I hadn't yet known. But as I took my grief and my troubles and my tears to the Lord, I experienced him like never before. Specifically, I experienced the tenderness and the gentleness of God. Church, I can tell you today, I know he's gentle. I know his tenderness, not just because it's spoken of in the scriptures, but because I experienced it firsthand in my crisis. He's so gentle. He's so tender. He's so patient. He's so loving. And I would not trade that experience even though I hated going through the crisis. I would not trade the experience that God gave me in it. And so I wanna encourage you today if you're walking through a difficulty, especially one in which you need the great restorer, in which you need the healing power of God, don't Run from your pain and your crisis. Embrace it and take it to God because it's in and through your crisis that you will encounter him. Just like Israel did. And you will know God is real. And he waits to be found by those who would search for him. Secondly, if we want to experience Jehovah Rapha, we must walk in obedience. In this Exodus passage, the Lord lays down a condition for Israel, and he says this in verse 26. He says, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. The Lord says, if you walk in obedience, then you won't experience the diseases and plagues I put on Egypt. No, you'll experience me 
as your healer. And the inverse is also true, that if Israel walks in rebellion, doesn't heed the voice of the Lord and refuses to obey him, they may very well experience the diseases and plagues that God put on Egypt. And as much as we may shrink back from this idea, we have to address it because scripture is clear. In general, the righteous and godly are blessed while the wicked and evil are cursed. Now, I understand that's a terrible generalization. It's a very big blanket statement. But it's so often stated all throughout scriptures this way that we can't ignore it. Go read 2 Chronicles. The godly kings that turned the nation back to God, they ruled longer, they saw less war, and when they did see war, they generally saw victory. Compare that with the wicked kings that turned the nation into sin. Their reigns were short, they faced invading armies against whom they could not win. And ultimately, both Israel and Judah, they're conquered by foreign armies, they're taken into captivity because of their disobedience to the Lord. So this is important. Church, your obedience to God is not for nothing. Your obedience really matters. It, it really does have consequences. The end of the very first psalm, it says the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. That's all through the psalms, that idea. It might be even more present in Proverbs. It says in Proverbs 3, 33, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. Again, the fear of the Lord adds length to life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. And one more from Proverbs, the righteous person is rescued from trouble and it falls on the wicked instead. Now again, let's admit, it would be naive to say that these truths are absolute. All right, we, we all know. I'm sure you could think right now of a situation in which it looks like the righteous ones got cursed and the wicked ones were the ones who got blessed. We've all probably done what is right at some point in our lives and it hasn't turned out the way we thought. This is part of the mistake that Job's friends made. If you read the book of Job, they took these truths to be absolute. That's why they accused Job. They're like, Job, you must have done something wrong. You, surely you've sinned because God doesn't bring this kind of judgment on the righteous. They made it absolute. They were completely wrong in their application of this truth. But just because it's not absolutely true in every case doesn't make it not true at all. It's like saying, if you wear your seatbelt, you're gonna be safe in a car wreck. We all know of tragedies that still happened even though people were wearing their seatbelt but you still have a way better chance of coming out alive if you wear your seatbelt than if you don't, right? Because that's a, it's a, just a general principle. So if you want to experience the Jehovah Rapha God, if you want to experience his healing and restoration in your life, seek to walk in obedience to him by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let the commands of God, the ways of God, the will of God lead you into life and blessing and healing because his ways are ways that lead to life. Sin is what leads to death and yes, at times even to physical sickness. Our obedience to God really does matter and it really does have consequences in this life. So if you want to see your body healed, your heart restored, your relationships mended, seek to walk in obedience to the Lord. Deal with the places of sin and compromise in your life. 
Likewise, if you wanna see your community, your land, your nation, or your government healed, point them towards the ways of God because the ways of God are life. And I, I felt, I must say very quickly, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which we praise God for. It, it opened up a wide door of possibility for God's healing and restoring touch on our nation. And it very well could be now that God blesses the states that choose to stop murdering children and that he withholds his blessing from the states that continue in sin. Time will tell. But again, this is a general truth from the scriptures. Healing, restoration, life, the blessing of God comes on obedience and righteousness. And that's part of the pathway to experiencing Jehovah Rapha. Third way, let God do what he wants. Let God do what he wants. We so often want God to heal and restore in the way that we want him to. On our timeline, according to our agenda, I'm very guilty of that. <laughs> But look back at the passage again in verse 24. This is awesome. It says, the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Moses cries out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water and the water became fit to drink. Now, that's weird. Like, a piece of wood? Did God need the piece of wood to heal the water? No, he's God. So why did he use it? Well, I, I don't think it's entirely clear from the passage. There are liberal commentators and scholars that will try to tell you that this was a kind of special log or bush and it could absorb the negative elements in the water. No one's ever confirmed the existence of such a bush or piece of wood. <laughs> this was a supernatural healing of the waters. And that being the case, then why did God use it? <laughs> I don't know. God chose to do it that way. <laughs> because God can use whatever means necessary. And this is what's so vital when it comes to experiencing Jehovah Rapha. For example, some people who want to be healed of physical sickness, they may refuse to go to the doctors because they just want God to heal them right now. Right, just do it now. That's certainly a lot easier if God does that. Or maybe they think it's somehow a lack of faith to go to the doctors. But what if the doctors are the piece of wood, figuratively speaking, that, that God wants to use to bring about healing? Some people want to be healed from trauma they've gone through in their past, abuse they've gone through in their past. But they refuse to go get counseling. They just want to receive prayer and be healed in an instant. Again, God can do that. It'd be awesome if he did it that way every time. <laughs> but what if the counselor is the piece of wood that God wants to use to bring about healing and restoration in your life and in your heart. God never needs to work through a certain method or means. He can do all he wants to do on his own. But oddly enough, he often chooses to use means. And so instead of limiting God or boxing him in, we must let him use whatever means or methods he wants to use in restoring us and in healing us. So if you want to experience Jehovah Rapha, let him do what he wants the way he wants to do it. It's like this old story I remember hearing in high school from a friend. 
There's a man stuck on a rooftop. He's in the middle of a flood, so he can't go anywhere. And like a good man of strong faith, he begins praying and asking God for help, and this rowboat comes by, and they say, hey, jump in. Come on, we can save you. We can get you out of here. And the man looks at him, and he says, "Uh, no, it's okay. It's all right. I'm praying to God. I'm trusting God to save me. So the rowboat goes on. Then a motorboat comes by, and they say, jump in. Come on. Come on, we can save you. Just get in. And again, the man says, you guys, the Lord's going to save me, all right? I'm trusting in the Lord alone to save me. So okay. Motorboat goes on. And then lastly, a helicopter flies overhead, and they yell, grab this rope. We'll, we'll lift you up to safety. And like he already said so many times, it's all right, guys. I'm praying to God. He's going to save me. Well, helicopter leaves, the waters rise, and the man drowns. (laughs) Then he's standing before God in heaven, and he comes before the Lord, and he says, hey, I was was praying and believing for you to save me. Why didn't you? And the Lord, like, looks at him and says, I sent you a rowboat a motorboat, and a helicopter, and you rejected all three of them. (laughs) What more did you want? The the man on the roof could have been saved. Somehow there's this expectation in his head that God was going to save him outside of the natural means that was provided to him. Likewise, in whatever area of your life, you need to experience healing and restoration. Open yourself up to however God might want to do it. Drop your demands of how and when God needs to do it and let him use whatever methods and means he wants to use. Finally, as we come to a close here, the last and ultimate way for us to experience Jehovah Rapha is look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Now, there's nothing in our immediate passage in Exodus that says anything directly about Jesus. But it's true that what the Old Testament reveals in part, the New Testament, in the New Testament we see it fulfilled fully in Jesus. In all his ministry, when we look at Jesus in the Gospels, we see that through him, the work of the same Jehovah Rapha, God of Israel, has come to earth. He heals the lame, the blind, the diseased. He heals those under demonic torment. And ultimately, he heals a spiritually dead people by offering forgiveness and salvation. And he goes to the cross to purchase our healing and restoration. In fact, that same Hebrew root word we keep talking about, Rapha, It's used in that glorious verse that describes the Lord's work at the cross. The prophet Isaiah says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Church, all the restoration all the healing, all the wholeness that's bound up in the Jehovah Rapha God, it all comes to us today through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's as I said at the start, this is a redemptive name of God. It's a privilege that now comes through Christ's redemption to every blood-bought son and daughter of God. And if you're here today, maybe you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never chosen to follow him. I tell you today that if you would repent of your sin and if you would put your faith in who he is and what he did for you, 
you would get access to the Jehovah Rapha God, the healer and restorer of all things, because it comes to us through Jesus. And so now, we're gonna end by doing just this, looking to Jesus as we take communion together. So if you got these, hopefully you did, when you came in. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Communion is not just about remembering. It's also about receiving. It's not just us getting all sentimental about what Christ did. We remember it, but we are receiving right now. Those of us that have put our faith in Jesus, we are receiving grace, life, strength, healing, and restoration as we come to the cross. We are on holy ground right now. Because this is no mere just symbol. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it. He took it in his hands and he said to his disciples, he said, this is my body broken for you. Do it in remembrance of me. And so right now today, again, we we do remember. But I want you to just right there in your seat where you are, wherever you're watching from, what is it in your life today that needs restoration and healing? I want you to hold that up before the Lord. And looking to Jesus alone today, I want you to just say this in your heart. Just say, Lord, thank you for your body broken for me. Lord, would you now release to me all the restoration and healing that came through your broken body. And I want you to lift up that specific situation. Whatever it is in your life, just say, Lord, the restoration that came through your body, let it be applied right there today by the Holy Spirit. Do that, thank him for it, and then partake. After the bread, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. And again, I want to say to you, church, this blood, this is what saves us. What Jesus did at the cross. The ultimate restoration we needed was to be restored to our creator, was to be restored to God. And Jesus, in one swift act, he did it all. He restored us to God. So I'll also say, if you're here again, and you are far from God, and you do not know Jesus, If you will repent of your sin and put your trust in his broken body, shed blood, you can be restored to God. You can be reconciled, made right with God. Saved for all eternity, forgiven of your sin. In church, every time we come to this blood, that's what we remember. The ultimate restoration we needed, we could never earn on our own. Restored relationship with God, we have it because of this blood. 
but also again, as we partake, I want you to hold up that specific thing in your life where you're going, God, you said you're Jehovah Rapha. Would you now release into that specific situation all the restoration and healing that came through your blood? Ask him that, thank him for this blood, and then partake. When you're finished, would you stand with me? Father, today we say thank you. Thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha, that you are the restorer, you are the healer, and there is nothing in our lives too far from your restoration. So Father, today I'm asking where there is healing needed in bodies that you would release it. Lord, where there is restoration needed in marriages, release it today. Father, where there's restoration needed between parents and their children, release it today. God, where there is healing that's needed in people's minds, where there is mental illness, God, restore and heal. Father, wherever your restoration and healing is needed, we're asking in the name of Jesus, release it today by the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray you continue to just stir our faith. Stir our faith, even as we leave here, to believe you, to restore and to heal in whatever way we need it in our lives. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Church, I want to invite you back next Sunday, but also today, if you have anything in your life that you need healing or restoration in, Calm down front. Our prayer teams will be here. They love to pray with you and for you for God's restoration, healing work. All right? God bless you guys. We will see you again next Sunday. Well, hello, Northwoods family that joined us online. Again, I'm glad you joined us. I wish I could see your faces. Uh, but I am praying that God would do his healing and restoring work in your life. If you want prayer with someone right now, there are online prayer host standing by who would love to pray with you and for you, all right? So we'll see you next Sunday. God bless you guys.